I don't know about you, but it, it feels to me like temptation and self-control kind of live in the same room with each other. I look at the way I live, the struggles I know that go on inside my head and my heart, and, and I'm like, who's driving this thing anyway? It, is it me and the way that I want to live, or is it the insecurities and the chemicals that shoot around my body and my brain? Why does it feel like my body is fighting against me all the time? Not just my body, but the temptation to, you know, to do things like put other people down so I feel more important, or, or just to tell a little bit more of the story than was needed because I'm still feeling hurt, or, or the temptation to keep my money all to myself so I can have that one extra thing you know that I didn't probably need anyway the temptation to stay silent when I should have spoken up self-control comes into all of these things so it's it's really about control over my willpower yeah and, and, and here's when we get to why self-control over my willpower is so significant when it comes to living a life that God longs for us to have. It all starts right back at the beginning. The two Hebrew creation stories sit, sit unashamedly side by side at the start of the Bible. In, in the first creation story, chapter one, we read how everything starts off in, in, in chaos. You know, there's, there's something like earth there, but it's got no form to it. Um, it's empty of life and it's dark. Uh, but God's spirit is hovering over this watery, chaotic mess, waiting. Then God speaks. He, he creates light on day one, sky on day two, land and vegetation on day three, stars and seasons on day four, fish and birds on day five, and then finally day six, animals, and then, still on day six, humanity. And what we read in there, it, it becomes the main idea for how humans are supposed to understand ourselves. You know, who are we? What are we even here for? I mean, we're talking the meaning of life itself, bursting onto the pages of the Bible from the word go. God makes humanity, male and female, to reflect his image. In other words, of everything in the whole universe, nothing reflects God as well as humanity does. Then we come to the second story, just at the start of chapter two of Genesis. Uh, in this story, humans are made first. We're made out of mud. Uh, he creates the first ever human, Adam, and he breathes life into Adam. By breathing into his lungs, he breathes his spirit into him. There's the second significant thing about humans. We're designed to carry the breath of God inside us, God's spirit living in us. So after he's breathed the spirit into Adam, then come the plants and the animals, and eventually God brings a second human into the world made from part of Adam. It's all going well, isn't it? Except from that point on, the story of the whole Bible from start to finish is one where humans choose to do our own thing. We choose not to represent God. We choose not to want to be guided by the spirit that lives inside us. We choose not to live by the moral compass that, that we know we have. So one of the main questions people have is this. If God is so, so good, like the Bible says, why is there so much that goes on in the world that is just terrible? Why doesn't God put a stop to it? And kind of, the answer comes back to us as individuals. Would, would I want God to do that? You know, what, what would be the consequences of, of God putting limits on my free will? When was the last time that I knew what the right thing to do was and didn't do it? When was the last time I personally knew the wrong thing to do and just waited right on in, you know? I don't know about you, but for me, that's like a daily occurrence. The ability to choose is so, so important in my freedom. Would I want to have children who were robots, who, you know, who, who loved me because they had to love me? Doesn't it mean more to me if my partner buys me a present because she's decided to, rather than those times when, you know, I bought the present and gave it to her to give back to me? 
when a couple stand in front of a wedding ceremony and they tell everyone that they're about to commit to loving and supporting each other when they have much and when they have little, when times are good and when times are hard, wouldn't it seem odd if you knew that one of those two was there because they had to be there and actually they had no choice about it? Our love for God, our love for each other and our love for ourselves it works itself out in the choices that we make. It's the freedom to make those choices that make our acts of love have meaning. Someone begrudgingly loving you means so little. Someone going out of their way to show they love you means so much. So what's all this got to do with self-control? Well, when we think of self-control, we we kind of automatically jump to things like eating habits or exercise or spending, you know, probably because they're easy to measure. Um, and then we go a little bit further and we start thinking about gambling or addictions or you know, social drinking and how we use our bodies in our relationships. And because we see it like that, self-control becomes like this negative thing. It's all about self-denial, all about what we're not allowed to do, honestly. When we look at the list of the fruit of the Spirit, our hearts kind of soar with the other eights, you know, with the love, yes, give me love, joy, oh, to have joy in my life, yes. Uh, peace, patience, kindness, uh, goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, so all these things, I'm like, yes, I want those things, I need them. It's also positive, and then the list ends with this heart-sinking negative slap in the face called self-control. But here's how I think God wants us to see that. Here is why I think that writer Paul sticks this idea of self-control at the end of this list. Imagine your will, your free will, is given to you by God, and God says to you, so, what do you want to do with your choices? What do you want to do with your lifestyle? And you answer God like this. Father, I choose you. I choose life. I choose to give my body, my mind, my intelligence, my ethics, my relationships, my dreams, my finances, my belongings. I give them to you, God. I choose you. I choose you. Breathe into me like you did into Adam. Mold me like you did him. Allow my choices, my life, my love, my life, my faith, my speech, my purity, to be a walking advert for you. Let the way I live and move and have my being be a constant act of worship, as if I'm a walking sacrifice everywhere I go. And God says back to you, I'll tell you what, why don't I come and grow inside you the ability and the power for you to do that? Why don't I make myself available to you, all of my power, all of my presence, so when you feel conflicted, when you feel those urges and you know your spirit is pulling against what you know I would like you to do, you can let go, you, you can lean into me and know that there is always a choice and I will empower you to make the right choice that chooses the God thing. Because choosing the God thing will liberate you to be more and more fully human as I designed you to be. Choosing the God thing will, will build your credibility and your faith and you will see my Jesus culture growing and blossoming all around you every time you worship me with your free will. So Father God, breathe your spirit into us again. Jesus, we ask you to move in us. Help us to see how you would have lived if you were in our shoes and spirit of God. We offer you our, our souls and our bodies to be a living, walking sacrifice. Would you send us out everywhere in your power so we can live and work in ways that honour you and display all of your goodness. Amen.